Okay, hey folks, um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, uh, sorry, I couldn't be there today. I would love to be in France. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some work that we've been looking at um, over the, the last uh, number of years in regarding regarding IPsec skill scalability, um, especially in the uh, area of single flows, so for handling alpha flows. Um, so, so, so I'm going to just talk a little bit, a little bit about the typical IPsec deployments and some of the performance scaling challenges therein. Um, we're going to talk about the the uh, pipeline of event pipeline approach that we took uh, based on uh, the IPsec site gateway and, and DPDK. Um, and I, I am aware of the work that uh, the Hammond and team have done in the IPsec gateway to en enable event uh, an event driven architecture. There, our approach was slightly different, and we, it was more focused on our hardware. So, uh, and and the IP looking at kind of some of the challenges in well, I talk about some of the challenges in general um, about uh, using a, a, an event driven approach um, for data event applications and the, the the key challenges that we came across to un unlock scalability. So, so uh, taking your application and uh, application pipeline around to completion and, mod and and looking how we needed to change that first just to it make it into a, a pipeline set of code, but then how we looked at changing that further to really leverage the, the best performance, both in terms of um, software queue management scaling and, and as well as the Intel's uh, dynamic load balancer or hardware accelerator. It's available on our Atom um, Snow systems and our next generation um, Sapphire Rapid um, codename Xeon processors. So, depending on your familiarity with IPsec, typically implemented in run to completion, so it, uh, a model where uh, we leverage on the ingress side RSS to distribute packets for load balancing. Um, and and you, in the top right pic of the corner here, uh, the picture I've shown where in this scenario where we have dedicated cores for inbound and outbound. Processing, of course, that's not a requirement. You can you can RSS load balance all ports against all um, against all worker cores, uh, which may give better load balancing. It, it and again, it will depend on your IPsec deployment. It, it, whether it's a case of you're having a gateway of tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of flows, that may not be optimal because it will induce even more cache churn for the table lookups. So, so you may decide to split and, and, and pin uh, certain ing the ingress path and, and egress path set to separate um, cores, uh, but. In general, one of the key challenges of IPsec processing is, that, and it's in general, is you you don't have guaranteed um, asymmetric balancing of of your work across cores. So you may have um, IPsec tunnels that are very large bandwidth that are only landing on one core, and that throughput of that tunnel will therefore therefore be limited to that single core. Um, we also on the on the egress path, we have some uh, we 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 we're, we can have be having many plain text flows that are getting mapped to a single uh, queue. So in, in that case, in, in in a simple or a naive RSS uh, load balancing scheme, it introduces a problem where you may have multiple plain text flows uh, that are load balanced across n number of cores, but they all have to egress in the same tunnel, um, and, and that then requires atomic um, operations uh, and on, on things like sequence number allocation allocation and th there that has implications on performance um, crypto processing then is it, typically just in terms of the the pipelines here so i'm just kind of this is a simplified view of the run to completion pipeline of uh, the, the ipsec security gateway in dpdk the sample application so you're doing your initial l2 l3 processing you're doing a security policy lookup, um, security association lookups then for the 
outbound path for ports that are defined as uh, protected. And then you, depending on the SA definition, you, you may be doing transport or tunnel mode IPsec, you're doing the sequence number allocation and encapsulations, you're doing the crypto processing. And then after the, the after crypto processing, you're doing a, a secondary table lookup uh, for, and, and, uh, and then deciding on your egress port and, and doing the L2 Mac encapsulation for transmit. Uh, the, the inbound, again, because of your time, I won't spend a lot of detail, but it, it's sim similar path just where they, after L3, you're just doing a straight security association lookup, you're doing anti-replay checks, your crypto processing, and then your anti-replay uh, window updates after post-processing. Uh, and finally, you're looking at the inner flows to, to see if they're valid for that particular tunnel and before, um, again, routing and forwarding decisions are made. So, so the, the, the typically in these pipelines, both uh, the, the ingress, egress, obviously for packet size crypto is the most significant element of, of your cost. But in IPsec, it's also worth bearing in mind when you're in those scenarios, security gateways with huge numbers of tunnels, the table lookups uh, uh, start to play significant uh, a percentage of, of your cost, especially when you're looking at a high throughput, um, sorry, a high packet rate on on a, on an average small packet size. So, so th some of the, those key performance um, challenges from that pipe pipeline is the atomic operations on the sequence number. So, it, for that uh, outbound IPsec path, um, in a you you in the, you can you can uh, do atomic sequence number allocation. So you can guarantee that the plain text flows maintain order, but that can cause out of order. If if you don't um, coalesce the stream back into a single queue for TX, it means that the packets may be sent out of order in terms of the IPsec sequence number. And that kind of implications on the anti play the requirements for the anti replay window on the other on the receiver end, or in the case of an implementation like that in in VPP, you can have uh, you have a handoff where the application pipelines identifies that once the SA lookup has happened, that this the the the, the plain text flow is associated with the tunnel that's egressing on another core and then the packet will be handed off and that will uh, uh, put a hard limit on your performance so actually in that sort of case the the the, the more in that case the more cores that uh, are leveraged for the same outbound ipsec tunnel actually performance degrades instead of increases with more cores so if you could isolate all of those plain text flows to a single tunnel you'll get better performance in terms of uh, scaling elephant flows then are, are, are a key one. So this is an elephant flow in terms of the IPsec tunnel itself. So uh, the your 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 bound essentially by the the, the processing uh, of usually a single core. So the, the, the that outbound uh, mo mo model that I was talking about is essentially also kind of you, you've hit essentially what is an elephant flow for the IPsec stack in that case, because you're not able to scale beyond that. But if you have like a, a tunnel that's handling uh, tens of gigabytes of traffic, then you can scale up performance um, by, by different approaches. So the most common one, I guess, is uh, offloading to a crypto accelerator, like so Intel is uh, the quick assist accelerator. So that uh, will typically, especially if you're on larger packet sizes, allow you to scale out the single core performance and then that, that'll increase the elephant flow. And that's especially true on the inbound. So inbound, with uh, you're, you're always going to be receiving that packet on a single RX queue. So unless you've got software distribution and all the associated state management that you would need for IPsec, you're going to be bound your, your maximum throughput is going to be bound by that core. So offloading to QA, something like QAT or another approach is to dedicate some cores specifically for crypto processing. So you can do the um, crypto processing 
in parallel, there's no dependencies between packets. So, so you can, if you have, you can ded, you could dedicate something using like DPDK's uh, crypto scheduler. You could dedicate X number of or n number of cores for crypto processing and use that as a an approach. But again, your for an inbound IPsec flow, all of your protocol processing has to happen on the same core. And, and then there's one other case, which is a key challenge for IPsec perform, performance, is just that lack of entropy. So especially in regards to inbound. So if you're dealing with a very small number of flows uh, or IPsec tunnels, then getting a distribution across your worker cores, you may have six, two, four, six, eight, 16 cores available, but if you're only having, um, uh, you only have like 10 or 16 flows, uh, tunnels being terminated, then you have no guarantee that they get pinned or are gonna get distributed evenly. And then if, if the traffic flows are asymmetric on those tunnels also, so if you've got high throughput tunnels and low throughput tunnels, then it's very difficult to get any sort of, um, or do any sort of load balancing to get an equal distribution across your available CPU resources. So, to to address those run to completion challenges in general with IPsec, we, we decided to have a look at the an event driven approach to the IPsec security gateway in, in DPDK, uh, and we wanted to evalu evaluate the the value proposition and performance that can be achieved in that event pipeline using both uh, the software event distribution, like with SQM and DPDK, as well as Intel's uh, dynamic load balancer. And the, the, the key elements of, I guess, again, any event-driven architecture is we, got, we, we have a producer and consumer that are handling ingress traffic from the network interfaces, distributing it into your event uh, distribution mechanism, whether that's a software mechanism with a dedicated core for doing distribution or, or a hardware accelerator. Um, and then you have your worker, single worker stage or multiple worker stages that are handling the processing of the the, 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 the stack. And then finally, you're, you're going to coalesce to a consumer, which is going to make sure that the packets egress in, in the correct order at the final stage um, of, of your pipeline. So I'm going to just try and get through these quickly to to get into maybe some of the, the more details. So we, we kind of looked at this initially and we had two ideal um, pipeline stages. And, and this was just taking the existing um, uh, IPsec uh, implementation and breaking it out into an event stage. Um, so so we, we have the producer, which is taking uh, packets off the, the NIC in, in queuing them to event device. Uh, then we were doing classification. So we, we had a ordered stage between the um, the, the producer and, and the classification. So, so that um, to to to, uh, to allow the to make sure that this any flow always is going is directed to the same queues. So, so we, with with the security. Um, Sorry. So we, we can do that classification in parallel with the order queues. Then after we've done the classification, we know with SA, we were then breaking out to atomic. So for the sequence number, so for an identified uh, flow for a uh, tunnel, we needed to do sequence number allocation atomically. After that, we can then do the crypto the IPsec processing in terms of, uh, say, packets, um, decryption, uh, in parallel, so atomically across many workers, and then we need to bring them back to a single f flow um, for our, our, our final stages of the, um, the, the, the the processing. And then in the outbound path, so, sorry, I've just realized I've, I've labeled these, this is the uh, outbound path that we've just went through. I was confused. And, and this is the inbound path. So the inbound path is slightly more complicated with anti-replay. Um, so the, yeah, the, we, you need to do the anti-replay check atomically. So so what we, we did it to allow the scale, allow better scaling out or proposed to do here is the, um, we split the anti-replay function into two stages. First, we are just checking that the packet is within the window 
and that it hasn't been received before. And we don't op update the anti-replay window because you can't do that till after you've uh, done the decryption and validated that the packet uh, has the correct hash and it's a valid received packet. So, so th th we were doing that uh, through the ordered queues so, so we can scale out, do the process decryption in parallel and then back to an atomic stage for updating the window once we know that the packet is valid. And, and then in this case, there still is um, some um, state sharing between the, the classification stage and anti-replay worker. And then finally, we're doing forwarding and transmit then. So the forwarding decision in, in, in any routing. Um, so with when we, we implemented that, uh, ideal or, or simplified um, event model and some of the the key things to, to look at when you're doing this for any model is the, the, the so the, the number of pipeline stages obviously affects the performance so the, the number each event in QDQ has a cost whether that's being handled in a software uh, scheduler or offloaded to hardware so the more pipeline stages the more the, the, that aggregate cost increases, um, but and and also it's more events for that um, distributor to handle. So uh, most hardware and software ultimately have a, a ceiling and kind of in the scalability of how many events that they can handle. So so we in terms of that we did two things. We we reevaluated re the pipeline to. Um, to, to, to reduce the number of stages slightly. And also we did some packet back batching at the first stage. So, so instead of having a single event per packet, we, we, if we had uh, matching RSS fields, we would batch them together. So just using the hash from generated from the NIC was doing a naive hash. And that was, that guaranteed that on say an inbound processing that we're getting all of the packets of the same flow going through the same uh, worker, so you don't have any movement of the of that uh, the, the the when we're doing the anti replay stage, we, we're not going to be doing it on different windows or different workers. Also, um, sorry, the the memory coherency. So, so when you look at the performance and how it scales, what you you notice is, which has a huge impact. Uh, in any pipeline application is if you're modifying the same area of the packet on different locations. So for instance, in IPsec, you're, we, we're doing, we were doing encapsulation or, um, of the IPsec header with IPsec header and potentially an IP tunnel header. And then later in the next stage, we were doing the lookup on that and the, the likelihood of those two stages being on the same worker and same physical core was low. So then you had all of the the data the, that you wanted to use to look up there, like the your IP headers, were not in cache on the worker that was doing that uh, forwarding decision, and they uh, that increases the number of cross course snoop. So we 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 redesigned the pipeline to. Um, to try and make all the the, the place all the to, to bring together all the places where we're modifying and looking at that memory, so we, we're cache optimized. Um, that's not completely always completely. Um, uh, 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 you can't do that all the time. So we were in certain things like the embuffs. We we literally looked and leveraged uh, instructions like CLD mode to uh, push. The, the down to L3 cache, the, the MBUF header. So, so it didn't have to do a cross course snoop when it was being leveraged in the next stage in the pipeline. So, so we, although we say we scaled down this, the number of stages, we only reduced it to five. So again, sorry, this is mislabeled, but um, this is the outbound. On the outbound, the producer, we're doing RX and batching. On the classification, we're doing the Again, the policy um, lookup and security association. We still have a dedicated sequence number allocation, but we uh, through an atomic stage. But we no longer actually uh, we're putting doing the modification that atomic that IPsec 
sequence number was actually just being stored as metadata. And it was used then on our workers, IPsec worker stage here to do to be installed in the to modify the packet. So in this case, we 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 weren't modifying any of the packet data until we got to the worker stage, which um, leveraged better performance. Um, and then we also moved the our L3 processing post encryption. Uh, to to that same worker stage, which also limited the performance impact of having modified that memory on a different core. Um, the inbound one stage is actually quite interesting. In so so we this, in the classification, the security association lookup, and the IPsec replay check were done in in the same stage. Again, we took. Uh, Again, as I went through kind of an ideal stage, we, we split the anti-replay function into two stages. One, to uh, just check that we haven't received that packet before and it was within the window. But the window, again, is not updated until after the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the crypto processing has, and decryption has been, uh, and the hash of the packet has been verified. Um, and this, we kind of viewed this as giving a best approach to given using the the, the given the, the value of the anti replay window to to protect you from DDoS. There still was some uh, there's still some potential here that um, you could get a number of packets of the same sequence number, but being able to do that at high gigabit throughput rates accurately would be um, I, I think very 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 difficult so so you're achieving you're by doing just this simple uh, replay check here at this stage um it allows us to scale out the workers uh, much more efficiently while still maintaining the protection for the application so, so then we, we did uh, some standard uh, ipsec performance uh analysis then on a two DT-based system for both our software SQM and, and our HQM or DLB-based um, implementation. So we had a traffic generators sending plain text traffic, and then we're forwarding the encrypted IPsec traffic between the two DUTs. So we have an IPsec gateway running on both DUTs. So, so I guess the the in, so some of the interesting things here in uh, in the, the numbers and, and we, we have a, a white paper in progress for this so they'll be published later this year um which we'll probably will go into in, in deeper uh in, in deeper and more in depth to these numbers but essentially for single tunnel ipsec um the event dev model works quite well for both Obviously, both software and, and hardware. Um, the, the, these numbers, the, um, what, what, they're, they're, what, what we find is actually we scale very well on a software side. It's about four cores, and I think you can, you, we, if you look at any of the software distributors that have been implemented in DPDK, you, you will see the same thing. Scaling is is quite effective up to about four cores, but after that point, the uh, the the, the cross-core snoops um, can uh, will will essentially put a limit on that scalability, and you you won't be able to uh, you don't get much value, and, and sometimes you can in, in certain scenarios can even lo lose performance. So you can see by adding more worker cores here on the green, we're losing throughput rather than gaining it due to the overhead on, on software load distribution. So, so with the DLB or hardware accelerator, we're, we see a, a near linear increase in packets per second as we increase the workers. Um, and this is for a, a, a 1024 byte plain text packet size for a single tunnel. So, so we're able to sco scale up at 16 cores. And this is all uh, software our, our core based crypto processing in this case to, to um, over 100 gigabits um, to, 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 for, for uh, our, of total throughput um, with 16 cores, which is like three, three, three and less than three and a half X what you can achieve for uh, with the SQM. So the, the, the SQM 
base module was getting just over 40 gigabits per second. Um, just by uh, in increasing the number of tunnels, um, we, we were able to get uh, so, some a modest increase in performance, but uh, and but with a, a reasonably similar di difference differentiation between the performance gain on SQM for, to the DLB. Um, and then just at the, the worst case scenario, where all packets here are are, are um, 64 bytes in size, um, you can see without the the value in terms of the mega packets per second, we're we're up just under 20 million packets per second um, for 64 byte packets with 16 workers. And and, and in this case, um, you you you're not getting this this is a it, this this is a it when I, if you go back to some of the kind of the problems that i lay out for term scalability this is a, a a good position to be in when you when you're in that scenario where you have a small number of tunnels handling and, and you want to scale be able to distribute uh, um, distribute your traffic evenly against your worker cores obviously very unlikely you're going to have 64 byte packets but you can see that you can signif you can load balance at, at that rate of up to 20 million uh, packets per second um, across, across your available cores and, and then we're just really hitting the limit of what can be achieved in terms of event and QDQs on our, our accelerator so in terms of the summary, um, the, 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 the in-run completion models were usually constrained by that of a performance of a single core. Um, and this this constraint can be overcome with a multi-stage pipeline, either by using soft, software-based uh, distribution or, or hardware. Um, the pipeline design that we have it, um, tends to saturate in terms of our maximum performance uh, in software, obviously sooner than hardware, dedicated hardware device. Uh, and we've kind of illustrated how we can, especially when you want to scale out to a large numbers of cores, that we can achieve nearly uh, four and a half times the performance uh, at that 16 core mark with the DLB hardware accelerator versus the software scaling out to that same number of cores. Um, but it, not only, and with the, 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 the mega pack, the pack, or sorry, the, the, that million packet per second number that we're just looking at also demonstrates that this can help you pr protect the user from those per traffic distribution scenarios as well by keep being able to achieve a, a really high rate of distribution across the worker cores, e even if the ingress flows are really unevenly distributed in terms of their work. And I guess the event dev library also is a proven and it's, it's an easy way to manage uh, building these multi-stage uh, pipelines that and, and then allow, gives you that flexibility to target different platform uh, acceleration techniques as well. So I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues who, who did a lot of work in this space and, and I'm just giving the presentation here. I, I, I can't say I was responsible for a lot of the development. So, okay, um, any questions? Declan, we have a question from one of our regular contributors uh, and a tech board member, uh, Stephen Heminger. He asks, why is a TX stage needed? Why not just have a transmit queue per core? So, so it um, on th that it, it because we're distributing out to, uh, um, on especially on the the, uh, the outbound path. You you have many workers in parallel that can be doing the, the crypto pro in, in crypto encryption and encapsulation and forwarding. So we have could have n number of workers work all working on the same flow in parallel. Um, and if you did TX at the end of this final stage here, then we could induce out of order packets on the wire. Um, so another maybe approach to that, in, instead of going through another stage of the pipeline, is we could have some sort of atomic locking and sharing a single transmit queue is another approach that's been looked at in other scenarios. But in this case, 
uh, we we uh, wanted to kind of keep a full event driven one but essentially it's it's it, because we have or this ip worker stage could be working on you could have multiple workers working on the cmip sec tunnel in parallel at this point um we need to guarantee that ordered x egress of packets from the system do we have any additional questions from the audience for Declan. Question from Liang. Uh, hi, Declan. Uh, I have one question about the DLB. Uh, if you notice any changes about the overall latency compared with the software solution, software pipeline? So, so yeah, there, there are um, latency implications of, of leveraging the, the accelerator like this similarly if you, if, to the way if you're using um, a quick assist or a crypto offload accelerator um, you, you're you're doing interactions over the PCIe bus so th those do uh, uh, have additional impact to the I guess the port to port latency of the pipeline but th that's a uh, Get, you you give that latency up to achieve the higher overall capacity so the, uh, of the my, of, of, of the for this for that single tunnel. Yes, yeah, so my understanding is if your pipeline is longer, that latency may how, how to say can increase potentially as well, right? Because we need to go through. Yes, back yes. So the yeah. more stages, that, that's another reason to potentially limit the number of stages of, of a pipeline because because each. Uh, each you're in queuing to the accelerator. It has to make a scheduling decision. Uh, your your worker has to then come and pick that um, that event up off the, its queue, and and, and so, so you'll get a aggregation. There's a, there'll be a, a like a, a cost to each in queue DQ function, and, and the, the number of stages that will be. Uh, Increased onto your 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 port to port latency. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. I have another question online from Akil Goyal. Um, he says, "Question for Declan: Is there in, are there any patches available for IP SEC SEC GW which create these pipelines?" So, so at the moment, we no, we haven't pushed this to the the DPDK um, uh, community. So that that's what we're planning over. Uh, I guess the, the course of the next number of quarters is to a lot of this work was started about two years ago um, as kind of a proof of concept and it was based on uh, a, a, an early 20 dot release of, VP, of DPDK so we we first have to get our house in order and, and re, rework the patches into the latest version of DPDK before we can share them with the community but that the intention is to upstream yeah any other questions from the audience before we wrap De and Declan, thank you so much for taking the time to present to us. We're honored to have you and really enjoyed your talk. Thanks.